Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Doom Vision podcast. I am one quarter of the hosting team, and this is kind of different than what we typically do. Uh, as you all know, we just finished playing Impossible Landscapes, and we are lucky enough to be joined here today by the writer and illustrator and just full-on creator of Impossible Landscapes, Mr. Dennis Detweiler. How's it going, Dennis? Good. How are you guys doing? It's nice to be here. Nervous. We're, we're all very <laughs> nervous to be talking with you. Oh, I'll please be don't be. <laughs> Try not to fangirl over here. <laughs> So we have uh, we gave all of our listeners the opportunity to ans ask some questions of you too. So we have some uh, some fan questions in here too. But I, I, I think we'll we'll just start off with uh, I, I think this is my favorite question that we have is Did you ever write anything that made you pause or doubt whether you should release it? Uh, that's a good question. Um, no, uh, I, I creep myself out sometimes, and sometimes I'll just have to walk away and go, wow, that's where'd that come from? <laughs> but a lot of impossible landscapes these days, uh, I get messages and I don't recall writing any of that. They'll oh, be wow. like, I love the part where X happened. And I'm like, I didn't write that. And they're like, it's on page 139. And I'm like, well, damn, I guess I did write that. <laughs> <laughs> Make me a liar. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I tend to go dark places uh, in my writing uh, it's an escape. It makes my life a little more happy and bearable. Um, but no, I, I try not to avoid even the even the darkest stuff. I mean, Delta Green is kind of predicated on that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. is that an interesting place for you to be in when you get like people that are, write to you and like, hey, on page one thirty nine, you wrote this, and you kind of have like this group of people that almost know your work better than you now. Is that kind of interesting for you? Yeah, I mean, um, I. To a certain degree, you know, I've been doing this since 1989, 1990. So I'm really old. Uh, <laughs> the era was um, so, born. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so I've, I've grown used to, um, you know, and a lot of the stuff I've done has been conspiracy-based, like horror kind of stuff, like a prototype for Activision. I, I wrote that video game and, and um, you know, people will, I'll randomly get texts about that even now going like, what did you mean by black light virus in this <laughs> mention? And I'm like, I have no idea. You know, I wrote that in 2006. Um, so I'm kind of used to the people knowing better than me what I wrote, especially for Delta Green, which has kind of garnered a very uh, <laughs> slavish following. Let's just say that. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. I almost feel like that was directed at us. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So, Dennis, um, I was the one that came up with that question, and it spawned from Asa Darabondi in Impossible oh, Landscapes okay. and the horrible things that he did. And as a mother of four, that the things that he did really bothered me, and it kind of threw oh, yeah. me, it, it really threw me off, and it kind of threw me off my character where I kind of took over versus what my character right. would do because that mother instinct kind of kicked in. So that's where that that question spawned where do you ever feel like, eh, should I release this? Is this going to be too much for my audience? Are they going to like, yeah. Ooh, that's cringe um, or Ooh, that's taboo. Yeah. I mean, um, so, you know, I have two kids. Uh, I, you know, it's a lot of it is a function of where I grew up. I grew up in New York city in the seventies and the eighties. And it was not a nice place. Like, the way it exists now is kind of a Disneyland. Like you go to Epcot to go to Paris and Epcot. That's what New York feels like to me now. It's like a big set that looks like New York, but isn't really New York. Yeah. Um, so a lot of horrible things kind of went on around there in my childhood. Son of Sam is one of my earliest memories. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my dad, we were driving around a Volkswagen and he's like, tells me conversationally when I'm five, that someone's shooting people with long hair if you sit in a car for too long, I'm like, Oh, and I vividly remember this. It was like the summer of 77 or something. Um, so I take these things with me. Uh, and I think exploring kind of the darkness inside of people, um, is what makes Delta green, uh, a little bit more interesting than the standard. Like it's a big squid monster. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I, I want, I want people to pause and I want people to be frightened and I want them to draw back from what I'm presenting in a lot of ways. Um, because I think that's, 
that's kind of the core of uh, exploratory and investigational horror that gets missed a lot is actually feeling something. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I understand it's dark and it, it, it's, it upsets me too. The Ace of Darabondi, the drowning room is a, is from a dream I had and is very upsetting oh, wow. to me even now. So and that's one of the things I love about like this campaign in particular is like, these you're putting so much of things that you actually know have, have experienced, like the setup of the layout of the apartments, like the bathtub in the kitchen yeah. and all of that, like that, yeah, that descriptiveness yeah. really made us be able to immerse right into it. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. No, I actually lived in a building that the McAllister is based on for about seven months in 1989 or 1990 hopefully no yeah it wasn't it it had no smoking lounge as far as i know but it 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 had a bath it had a bathtub in the main run that led up to the living room so like it was a hallway with a bathtub in it and then there's the living room um and that was just normal you know it really wasn't a big deal in new york well like and for us it's so different that like i kind of got hung up on it in my brain like is this supposed to be like this is this a clue like am i supposed to (laughs) follow the pipes follow the pipes (laughs) uh one, one thing that i really like about delta green is that a lot of times it's not the threat of like the monster that is horrifying but it's like what people are willing to do you know, like what oh, yeah. the, 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 the depravity of humankind and, and, and what we don't know and what we're, you know, uh, uh, what we're capable of is sometimes worse than some cosmic horror. Uh, and oh, oh, yeah. I love that Delta Green explores that a lot because, you know, making an agent or making a person make a hard choice um, is uh, you get to see what it means to be human. So that's that's something I've thought about a lot when playing this game. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's that's a goal of the game. So mm-hmm. uh, it worked. Yay! Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> awesome. and us as players didn't know about uh, what was it like the how Cor- how the corruption. the corruption. Yeah, the yeah. secret oh, mechanic. Oh, yeah. in the game. We didn't know yeah. about they were that. so mad at, that I was. I, I had this mechanic. I was like <laughs> keeping track of on the side. Uh, uh, yeah, just a sliding scale of like, oh, I guess you go up a corrupt. This is gonna happen to you because yeah. you're yeah. this crazy. <laughs> right after we ended, I was like, oh, by the way, I've been keeping track of this. And they're like, what? <laughs> this is what? why you saw the dead drowned child <laughs> yeah. in the air vents yeah. in Hotel yeah. Bernalbin. <laughs> Here you go, Jess. <laughs> Thanks, Kev. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought that was fun. Yeah, I, I like that mechanic it's nice and simple and yeah you know keeps keeps the focus on the players which is cool yeah so one of the things that really impressed us about impossible land landscapes we're all well three of the four of us are veteran role-playing game gamers and this is one of the biggest campaigns that we've ever seen and and so i think what really stuck out to me is how many little things there are how many um intricacies there are with you do something you know in the past and it significantly impacts the future how did you keep all of that straight in your head or did did you make Uh, sanity rolls uh like like red lines going everywhere (laughs) connecting things i I had i i had a flow chart uh i still have it it's a big mess um (laughs) but but the truth is, uh, what you see as Impossible Landscapes wasn't just kind of one writing and then it's done and we moved on to art. It was, I wrote it, it went to editing, it came back to me. I went, this isn't good enough. Let's go again and layer and layer and layer until, you know, nine or 10 times I did that. And the, the goal was if someone pulls back a curtain, there's another curtain mm-hmm. as deep as I could make it in all directions. Um, so the players are never just left the exposed, um, you know, until the very end of the game, which is by design. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, there was a lot of careful thought that went into a ton of it. And then there's another layer on top of those 10 or 12 rewrites, um, which was the art direction and the layout and design. So we have a very uh, talented layout artist named Jen McCleary. And she grew weary of me very quickly uh, because I was constantly going like, this looks great, Jen, but can we do X or Y or Z? And adding in all the notes and arrows and changing the headings. I don't know if you noticed in the book, a lot of the headings are changed. So it'll say, um, don't mind if my lights flash, that's just the front door. Um, Someone's at the door. Uh, 
the headings the headings in the book will say like a yellow card and then that'll change if you flip through possible landscapes the side will say cut here to remove peace and it'll mm-hmm. say you know cut neck to remove peace or something horrible mm-hmm. um, yeah. and they get worse and worse as the game goes on and i did all that with jen uh who was a wonderful amazing uh a- angelic layout artist who always did what i asked uh, award and, winning uh, never- right yes yeah. Yeah. well deserved we, 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 we um, voted she also on laid that out, <laughs> laid, yeah she, she laid out uh the fall of delta green as well oh wow uh, which yeah. is the other book so uh but yeah so layer upon layer and um the conceit of the campaign is everything points back towards one thing um so that makes it really easy to kind of flow chart uh you know, it's one step to the King Yellow for nearly anything there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So the entire campaign is built to be an onion that kind of folds in on itself to a center point, a nub that you'll always end up at. Mm-hmm. Um, so that made it a lot easier than the standard, like, you know, a mask of your throat tap or where you're world hopping and kind of mm-hmm. you can go in a million different directions. This always you're always going in one direction. You just don't know it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I was the one that uh, I was the handler and I did all the reading. Oh, um, cool. I have never had a book uh, make me like uh, I've never had a uh, a game book like this, like make me creeped out as much as this one. I remember <laughs> I, I was reading it and I was totally alone in my house and I was like, I need to turn on some lights. I feel like I'm being watched. I <laughs> legitimately felt like I was being watched and I would get to a point where like, you know, there'd be like notes written in, in between like the words and I'd be like, Okay. All right. This is. Uh, I don't feel good. <laughs> there were there were many nights he woke up at three a.m. just thinking about yeah, thinking about our campaign, campaign and what's going oh, on good. with it. And yeah, yeah. It's good. Crazy. That's awesome. That's that again. Uh, mission accomplished. I feel. And, and I love feel the good. beginning. Yeah, I heard that. I love the beginning where it says like one of you is going to have to eat this book, you know, you know, to summarize, it's like one <laughs> yeah. of you is going to be the one that is going to have to do this. And it was me. And I, yeah, yeah I, I read each scenario so many times. Uh, you know, oh, cool. it, it was just, yeah, I couldn't describe it better than, yeah, I got to chew it up, eat it, digest it, figure it out. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I loved it. I loved it so much. So uh, great. Thank you. It's always great to hear. So Dennis, you know, diving into impossible landscapes, um, looking back at it now, and now you've, you've been ran it yourself 10 times. You said you're, you're playing your 10th. Is, yeah. there, is there anything that you wish you would have done differently when you were writing it, R- written something differently, tweaked it a touch? Uh, I, you know, there's always stuff I wanted to add and there's a lot of stuff that got cut. Um, you know, maybe about 40 or 50,000 words didn't make it. Um, if, if I, you know, if I ever read, if I ever, if, sit down and going to do a 2.0, I will write a scenario that goes before impossible landscapes uh, that goes before the night floors where you meet agent Marcus in New York and you are recruited on a standard Delta green operation. And then I will integrate that into the entire thing. I do that by default. Anyway, every time I ever run it, we usually play a victim of the art first, which is another scenario. Oh yeah. Um, But the way I tie it in is, you know, you're investigating 16 year old boy when you get to, you know, spoilers, when you get to Ambrose's house in Carcosa, all the furniture in that boy's bedroom is being built again and again there. You you realize the whole thing was a set and the monster is a prop and you, you know, so that's clever. That's good. um, Well, well, yeah, I mean, one of the important conceits is, you know, Delta green, the Roswell saucer, Cthulhu. These are all just, pointless fictional things the king yellow is the only real thing um and and yeah so so if i had to change it that's probably what i do but the book would be 500 pages and cost you know 129 dollars or something <laughs> you would still buy yeah. it Sold? <laughs> yeah. Sold? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no and and so on that same vein of what you would change uh like what are you most proud of of impossible landscapes what's your favorite part Oh, a uh, part. Um, I don't, you know, uh, I really like um, a volume of Secret Faces, the way that came out. I really like um, uh, Nurse Samagina's house. Oh, oh my that's my favorite. Oh my that's, gosh. Uh, I'm with you. Yeah, that's my favorite. That's the uh, thing that made me terrified. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Spoilers, I put a bullet in her brain. <laughs> yeah, really up. <laughs> oh, good, good. It really, it really upsets, really upsets a, a, you know, a large amount of people. I've gotten a lot of, hey, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> the whole fucking lin- linseed oil on the walls yeah. and giant fire and the vents and yeah. screw the you, tea? that sucks, you know. And the, the tea. The, tea, oh. the, the corrosive oh, yeah. bathtub tea. <laughs> oh, that's so gross. And well, well and it's funny because well, that part is what disturbed our handler the most. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh yeah. So so I'll tell you a really funny little note, since my players are unlikely to see this. They're they just met the the night manager. I in love night Castane. Uh, yeah, Castane. And Castane went to his neighbors to bring back tea because his stove doesn't work. And it's the Sam and Gina's tea. Oh. 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 Oh, no. And they, they drank it. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Those poor, poor so, people. So yeah. they'll find it. They'll find they're in a volume of secret faces. Now it's 20 years later and they're starting to see things again. They'll, they'll figure it out before it's through, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh that's boy. so gross. Kevin, do you want to tell why it yeah. disturbed you so much? I, I was really disturbed by the fact that like, um, the, the nurse Sam Eugenia is living out her missing and dead husband and child's lives simultaneously at the same time that freaked me out a little bit and then the recording uh of her of the son like killing the father oh yeah i recreated that recording for the show by myself oh cool in my in nice. my in my house you know so i was just like knocking stuff over and clinking bottles together <laughs> and recording it and then i played it for them and uh i just yeah that whole that whole place just got under my skin a little bit so yeah good good bravo Uh, who is your favorite character, your favorite NPC in Impossible Landscapes? There were so many cool characters that came out. So uh, J.C. Linz, the author, uh, is my favorite character. And it's mostly because that's John Tynes. Oh. So oh. John, John, I mean, in the portrait in the book is John Tynes. Mm. So if you ever see him at a convention or something, you'll recognize him. But John was kind of my partner for Delta green. Uh, and he wanted to write the King yellow stuff, you know, and he just never really got around to finishing up what he was writing. He wrote this great outline, which is kind of vaguely what it's based on. Kevin actually um, read that too. The short story about Hotel oh. Dalbin. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I read that story before it ever went anywhere. John was my, my roommate and went, Hey, look what I wrote. And it was amazing. Um, so JC, Linz being the author, being this distorted, weird figure that lives in this nightmare world. Um, there's something attractive about him. I kind of uh, associate myself with him when I'm writing the book. Um, you know. In that case, I have some beef with you after I handed you the bottle. <laughs> they got so mad. I got some beef. We were so mad when we handed that bottle over. So mad. So w- w- with that being said, uh, I-, I think the question <laughs> that I've been waiting to have answered for a full year, oh, it no. took us to play this th- campaign. What's in my bottle, Dennis? <laughs> oh, God. I don't know you well enough to say what's in your bottle, but uh, we could go get some minor hats and, you know, some rope and go downstairs and see if we can find it. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to turn, you got to turn left near the, the elevator, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I particularly loved was every time Kev, cause we played on roll 20. Every time Kevin yeah. would give us a handout of your art. Mm-hmm. That really oh. was fan, excuse my language, but fan fucking tastic. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. So not only helpful, but it was so vivid and I couldn't believe at some point, like that some of them were, Art, I think, like, I didn't believe that they were paintings. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I, I thought they were pictures. That, yeah. I, 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 every, everybody <laughs> I played with, I, every time I yeah. show a piece of something that you you've made, they're always like, "Wait, that's not a photograph." I thought that was a photograph. I'm like, "Look closely. Oh, no. You can see the brush strokes. I, you can see, yeah." I I wish it was. It'd be a lot quicker. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I love art. It's you know, and I love dark. I love dark horror based art. Um, writing, you know, people get really upset when I say this, but writing is so much easier than art. Um, I like, I, I love writing and it's fun, but it's like, bing, 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 bing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, art is like, 
It's like visualizing it first. Your nose and pulling it out your mouth. You know, (laughs) it's it's hard. So, what was the process of trying to visualize these these people, these things, and then being able to incorporate them into the campaign, the scenario? The yeah. I I had a really really lucky break in so much as I wrote. Uh, the night floors in 1995, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I had, you know, decades of thinking about all that. Um, so when I jumped into it, uh, night, night floors was very easy to get a grip on. I already knew what all those people looked like in my head and um, lots of sketching, lots of figuring out. And then it, we, we had to figure out how to make the book look crazier and crazier the further you got into it. Um, so that, the, I realized midway through that, that, oh, the, there's an upside to this. Like, we're going to need about half the amount of art for Carcosa that we need at the beginning of the book. The yeah. beginning of the book is all detail. Mm-hmm. And the end of the book is like, you're all fucking crazy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, you know, it was just a lot of work. I think there's something like 80 paintings or and that that's that's the most I've ever done uh, for a single book. Wow. Well, and. and- each of them are very impactful. I, I mean, again, oh, with the little in- intricacies, uh, like the one that I think really stands out is uh, Thomas with his wife, with his wife and the clown arm. Like oh, I had to look I at that three out, yeah. times yeah. before I even noticed the clown arm, mm-hmm. and then I was like, <laughs> "Oh my god!" Mm-hmm. Or like how many times I looked at like the cover of a book or some like a business card and been like okay, these, these letters in this sequential order, what could this <laughs> expand out to be? Whose name is this? What do I need to jumble this yeah. up yeah. to be? I, I had a, yeah. uh, Cynthia Lachance or whatever, the, the yeah. Art, Art Life Foundation. Art uh, Life. They yeah. didn't look into Art Life at all. No. But I played this as practice with uh, my sister, and they latched onto the fact that she had yellow sign earrings uh, in the oh, art. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, I didn't even notice that. How like, did we miss that? Yeah, you guys just didn't, didn't look into our life at all. I guess so. we're going to have to play the game again. Yeah. We got wiser as yeah. we went along. Yeah. Cameron's yeah. going to go back yeah, in. I mean, it's, that's one of the interesting things about uh, the game is that you can run it a couple different times. And it's, just, I've run, you know, it's the 10th time we're in a volume of Secret Faces. It's totally different. It's every time completely yeah. did weird crap that but, I was like. Okay, we're here, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no idea. He, uh, she uh, murdered uh, Thomas Manuel. Uh, I did. Fourth, fourth episode. Yep, shot him in the back nice. of the head yeah. accidentally. I, I was blown away. Oh. I was like, <laughs> Ac- accidentally. I was trying to shoot him in the butt or the leg to slow him down because he was yeah. running, and then I just rolled just really it. well. Max damage. <laughs> Max damage. <laughs> well, and yeah, my, my oh, oh, and he sorry. tried to summon a demon episode two. Episode yeah. two. Yeah. <laughs> episode two. Yeah. Good. <laughs> That's hel- That's healthy, actually. The demons <laughs> are friendly. They're nice. Um, you know. So, but uh, yeah, my players. Uh, God, what did they do? They, you know, they they were really clever. They immediately started. They they accidentally murdered someone as well and used the night floors to get rid of him. Oh, why did we ever think of that? They, oh. We used the. Clues. They were like, they just dragged him up to the ballroom and left him there, and oh, in the morning, shit. it's gone. That's a good idea. Well, that is a really, really good, good idea. idea. <laughs> Yeah, it worked. So, uh, Dennis, I w- I'll tell you that you have uh, inspired both Kevin and I. We are now in the processes of writing our own Delta Green scenarios. Uh, oh, cool. So nice. thank you for inspiring us. Uh, but this actually comes from one of our listeners. Uh, sure. and they, they write, how do you apply inspiration from other sources like movies or books in your writing without copying the original work? And then what are some of your favorite sources of inspiration? Uh, so I, I try and keep disconnected from, um, in particular, like, uh, competing product. So I don't, I don't really pay attention to call Cthulhu anymore. I don't, I don't read their books. I don't, you know, just in case we're, I don't want to step on their toes and I don't, you know, that they might be doing something really cool and I get an inspiration from it that kind of seems different to me, but isn't. So I'm trying to keep my distance from that. Uh, my favorite stuff. So I don't know if you can see behind me, the, uh, the, I have a giant bookshelf that goes on forever. Oh, wow. Oh yeah. my God. Uh, nice. And it's, it's a whole far wall basically. Um, and I, I, I religiously collect books on the occult and UFOs and, um, you know, back, you know, 
uh, when we did Delta Green, X Files wasn't even a thing. Um, me and John were like reading books on Roswell and, you know, in 91, 1990, maybe. Um, so when X Files came out, we were like, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but in general, I look at um, historical fiction uh, or occult fiction or occult nonfiction and just uh, pay attention to weird uh, stories a lot. Uh, and then, uh, anytime I have a dream that's of interest, I write it down and things come together or don't. Um, and I try and avoid, um, I, I will never actively crib someone else's work. I mean, that's just lame. Um, right. but if you're running a home game or something like that, it's not a big deal. You know, people do it all the time. I saw, I saw X horror movie and now I'm going to run a Delta green operation based on that. There's no harm in that. Do you have any advice for us writing our first campaigns? Uh, should the advice be not to write them and just, you know, try to escape Delta <laughs> no. Green? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, you know, uh, so I'll, I'll say a couple things. One, um, it's a really hard uh, road to hoe. So Delta Green, as far as we go, um, many books have died on the vine in, in Delta Green creation. Uh, only a handful of people have ever written any Delta Green stuff because we we don't expand our teams. It's usually one author, one product. Um, and, you know, we very recently initiated a new writer, Caleb Stokes. Um, he wrote God's Teeth, which is another incredible podcast, if you've not heard that from Role Playing Public Radio. Um, and uh, he wrote God's Teeth, and it was just so spot on perfect. Just pitch perfect for delta green no changes just holy crap yes um that's a really hard note to hit even for the creators of delta green even for john and me and scott we have a hard time getting it right out of the gate so it's it's a difficult thing to attempt uh we don't generally hire external writers that's another thing um but we'll always look at stuff um you know um and you know we're we're neck deep in product we have to release already so that's another huge bottleneck is we have, we got another nine books to go or something like that. And we're working away on them, but it's a lot of work. Well, we're excited for those. Yeah, that's yeah. great news to to hear. <laughs> Oh, cool. Cool. Uh, so I kind of came up with uh, a question here. So given that Delta Green is sure. inspired by Lovecraft's work, um, so what original story did you read that caused you to kind of fall in love with cosmic horror or like even any anything really? Uh, that caused you to fall in love with this uh, realm? Yeah, so Arthur Machen, uh wrote a story called The Great God Pan. Um, and Machen's kind of the predecessor to Lovecraft in Cosmic Horror a lot. You'll see a lot of Lovecraftian stuff cribbed from that. Uh, and then I read At the Mountains of Madness, and I read uh, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, and um, Dreams in the Witch House, and, you know... Those kind of stories really, um, I, I really dislike Lovecraft as a, a writer, but I love his ideas. Um, and, you know, his plotting is pretty crappy sometimes and his characters <laughs> don't generally act like people a lot of the, oh my Lord, the monster is eating my foot right now as I write this. You know, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, so uh, but co the, the concept of cosmic horror is interesting to me on a fundamental level because it's so much more pure and human than supernatural horror, supernatural, you know, angelic demonic horror implies an afterlife. It implies an escape. It implies if you're good, you're going to go to a good place after you're dead. And cosmic car is just like, Nope, you're fucked. Um, Oh, can I see that real quick? So, yeah, I mean, as you can tell, we were all pretty frightened, scared. We all lost sleep over this campaign. Um, I, <laughs> I got some, I got some, uh, a lot of rage put my way. Um, a lot of angry text yeah, messages. I blamed you a lot of the time. Why? Said, he, he wrote it. I didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> Kevin's spooky, sleepy corner. Yeah, we, we had a, we had a lot of uh, <laughs> segments that, and, that yeah, yeah came through. Uh, so with that, what? scares you or causes you to lose sleep because as you know a master of your craft master of horror you know um yeah it's it's <laughs> uh what what keeps you up like what spooks you out uh so 
Uh, high high level. Um, I I can sleep on command in any situation. So <laughs> in a moving Greyhound bus, I'm on top of the bus. I can just go to sleep. I'm not even kidding. Jealous. My wife hates me. She yells at me all the time. Uh, she'll go, okay, we're going to bed. I'll go into bed and just be asleep. And she'll come in five minutes later. And it's like, I've been asleep for like seven months, <laughs> um, you know? So uh, the answer is nothing really keeps me up uh, literally or figuratively. Um, I, I like to think I'm just stupid enough to understand where I actually belong in the universe, which is I'm just a little semi-conscious blip that's going to be here and then gone. I don't overthink it. I don't have to change the world. I, I'm not going to, I'm just making games and people are having fun with those games. Um, I think, I think a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety rises out of, um, uh, how important you see yourself in the world and how how much of a shape you have to kind of make in the world to feel okay. Um, and I, I'm lucky enough, I'm old enough, I should say, that I've kind of gotten past the point where I do that anymore. You know, 15 years of my life was spent hunting bigger and better roles in video games based on that fear, that anxiety. And the moment I left that behind uh, in 2016, my entire life downshifted to like it's happy creation time all the time. And it's just great. So uh, the stuff that creeps me out, there are, there are a very select few films and books that have actually scared the hell out of me. One of them, um, you know, I'll name a couple ghost story by Peter Stroud is perhaps the scariest book I've ever read. The first 40 pages. I'll never forget just totally new type of horror blew my socks off uh, movies. The exorcist is, is a movie that sits with me. Um, the exorcist three sits with me. Hereditary sat with me. Oh yes. Ooh, um, yeah. You know, there are very few films that kind of get anything but a happy giggle out of me when it's, you know, people getting their heads cut off or blown to bits mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. it's like, Oh, that was neat. You know, but hereditary full on, thinking about that for days afterwards and that, you know, the whole swimming through the night air kind of thing. Yes. Whoop, still think about that from time <laughs> to time. Uh, yeah. So, you know, things do scare me and there are people who are masters of such things. Um, but mostly what's considered horror these days doesn't really scare me all that much, um, which is always disappointing. I'm always ready to, I, mm -hmm. I heard a big deal about mm -hmm. insidious and I was so excited uh -huh. and, I yeah. went to go see it and I was like, yeah, this is okay. You know, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> yep. You know, uh, yeah. it wasn't a bad movie. It just wasn't very scary. Um, you know, so I'm always looking for that fix. I love that feeling of, holy fuck, what was that? You know, oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so when you apply that to your writing, because I think horror is a really unique genre where for something to be scary, it has to be new. Like if we've seen a ghost before, a ghost kind of, that fear of the unexpected is gone because you've seen a ghost. I, I think it's different in like comedy where you can just tell the same joke over and over the mm -hmm. joke. If the joke's funny, it's funny, but horror doesn't kind of resonate that same way. Does that impact your writing or your creation at all? Uh, so impossible landscapes is kind of unique in that it's surreal horror and um, surreal horror. You know, I wrote a big section on impo in impossible landscapes about surreal horror, but the, the core conceit there is it's, it's familiar horror used it's familiar thoughts used against you. It's, you know, I understand this place, but now it's different. There's a door in the wall that wasn't there before. It's that's, that's inherently frightening. You come home to your apartment and there's an extra door. You're, you're I'm done. That's my story. That's, that's my horror story right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so much other horror requires a setup, uh, you know, vampires exist and they live in this town and they do this surreal horror is just like, you know, Fuck you. There are wet footprints from your bed back to the bathtub and no one in the apartment when you wake up. You heard nothing. Done. There's your story. Um, and people are going, oh, shit. What does that mean? You know, how do I figure that out? Um, so, yeah, you know, telling the same joke over and over again, I think that's true in horror. I think a lot of what we see today is just kind of uh, hitting that high pitch key at the end of the keyboard again and again and again until people are just bored out of their minds. So the stuff that really resonates, like It Follows was a great film. 
that yes. came out of nowhere and hit a whole mm-hmm. bunch of different notes that I had never heard before. And I just mm-hmm. went, you know, the sequence where the big guy comes in the room when she opens the door. Oh, yep. Holy hell. Like, yeah. <laughs> yes. I was just like, this is it. You know, we need to get yeah. more movies like this. Um, but for every one of those films, there's 60, you know, Bloom House. And then the murderer is actually a jigsaw puzzle <laughs> yeah. man, you know. Here's um, a jump scare, and there's yeah. a jump scare, yeah. and yeah. then yeah. that's the end gore, of the movie. Gore, 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 gore. Yeah. yeah. Lots of blood so, and a jump scare. And yeah. Yeah. So I'm PG-13. always looking for. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just said oh, rated PG-13. Every time I see PG-13 <laughs> yeah. on a horror movie, I go, uh, it's probably not scary at all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we have we Kevin and I have been watching a show called From lately. We, we oh, actually yeah. Stephen yeah. King was raving about it. We're like, okay, we'll give it a shot. And we're like, holy shit, this is very Delta this, Green. This is Delta Green, <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, yeah. We get that a lot, you know. Um, the what was the other show that I quite enjoyed? Um, oh, um, uh, Channel Zero season two, uh, No End House, is exceptionally well made. Uh, just that season. The other seasons, <laughs> I was very excited to get to the other seasons, and they were just kind of like, eh. but uh-huh. season two was, cre- uh, you know, Black Summer is another great series on uh-huh. Netflix, a zombie, another zombie horror movie a show that could have just been the same old notes, and it's not at all, and I didn't uh-huh. expect it at all. Um, so I, I love things like that. I live for little entertainments like that. Absolutely. So I'll tell you, Dennis, it takes quite a bit to scare me. And and one of the things that made me the most uncomfortable about playing Impossible Landscaped was that I had uh, I had this perception that I had control. And then all of a sudden it was consistently pulled out from under me. He says um, that because yeah. he put on a gas mask. <laughs> I did put on a gas mask. Yeah. Nice. Um, is that something that you intentionally write in to, to kind of give that false sense of security? Cause I, you know, Delta green is different than every other role-playing game out there, but giving that false sense of security, like, Oh, you're, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Nope. Fucking got you. Didn't I? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's required. And, and this is a, this is a common conceit. I find myself fighting against in like talking about horror games People will go, what if it was science fiction and Cthulhu, you know, we could blow him up with a nuke. And I'm like, it's like, it's just Star Trek. That it doesn't mean anything. Like you could play yeah. that and that's fine, but it's a science fiction game. It's not a horror game. Um, horror is about uh, understanding where a line is, or maybe even thinking you understand where a line is past that point. You are at risk. And when I say risk, it's either your character will be lost or you will die. Your character will die. Um, and that risk has to be real or the feeling, the commensurate feeling and the feeling of victory, if you man- manage to go past the line and come back, will not mean anything. Um, and this is why games like 5e and struggle so much is what's the challenge? Go kill a bugbear. Ten yep. rolls later, I killed the bugbear. You know, you never really mm-hmm. feel like your character is going to be just beheaded by a bugbear or and it it really should feel like that to give you the kind of uh, push um, uh, that that makes adventuring adventurous. Um, so or that like, that uh, the idea of control and ceding control and losing control is central in all of Delta Green. Well, and in this particular campaign, we never knew if the things that we thought we succeeded against were actually finished. If they would come back later on, and twenty oh, years yeah. later, and Kevin again, the lion. Yeah, he, he got us with the oh, lion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lion, lion made a lion. return. <laughs> yeah, but I'm uh, glad, <laughs> Troy. I'm glad that you said that because Kevin actually has a really good theory about um, the necessity of the play of the King in Yellow and how it plays into Carcosa in the real or the world that we perceive as real. And I'm going to let him take that over. So yeah, okay. I. So they they were when when they got to Abby and they she said, hey, you know, go find J C Lynn's, give him his bottle. It's really important. Um, they were so mad at Abby. They were like, I'm going to shoot her in the face next time I see her. Like they were so (laughs) pissed off. They're like this whole time she's been, you know, a pawn or whatever. Um, and I had, I I sat down and I kind of had a thought about it. Uh, and then I slept and then I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like fever dream. And I was like, okay, (laughs) the, the play has to remake itself or it's, or the whole, you know, existence as we know it is done for. 
Like it yeah. has to, this has to happen forever. This has to happen over and over and again. Again, we can't, uh, we can't stop it from happening because if we do, then everything is gone because that's the real world and we're in the fake world. And if we destroy the brain, the memories die, which is what we are. So I, it took like three days after we were done with it for me to be like, don't blame Abby. She was making the world go round. <laughs> like she was making the world exist. Like so. Carcosa would suck in our yeah, it world. It sucks in if times and places. And yeah, yeah. 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 No, I mean, you're exactly right. So the, the whole idea is the King Yellow is the only real thing. Um, and everything, you know, where we live and what we do in our world is, is backstage. It's just, we're here and we're circling and doing stuff. Um, you know, the other thing is like, you know, I, I said this to a player the other day, I said, you're fairly certain people don't die, you know, because you've never died yourself. So how do you really know that people die? Well, I've seen people die. It's like, well, did you make sure they were still buried? Cause they could still be alive. Right. That's well, I saw my grandmother. Point. Wow. Yeah, I saw my grandmother in a coffin. It's like, well, did you see her go in the ground? <laughs> no, you know. And then, and then it's then his grandmother turned up at one of the one of the masked meetings later on. Um, oh, yeah. and, oh. yeah. and he was not at all happy about that. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, so the the high level conceit is everything you know, everything is just a spinning bit of debris thrown off this central real world which is Carcosa and the play and the King. And that's it. That's the only real thing. Everything else is just a fiction that exists to enact that thing. So, yeah. So I think impossible landscape, you know, Kevin, Kevin gave us some insights onto the alternate endings at the end, but uh, with today's day and age, right? Everything has a sequel. So you're writing impossible landscapes part two. How, how do you start? <laughs> Oh man, oh, I don't even—I don't even think you can do it. Uh, I mean, <laughs> all the characters who have ever out of the ten playthroughs, we've had maybe five survivors, maybe six. Um, we had one. <laughs> yeah. It was my second character, though, so it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, we've had characters eaten by the king. We've had you know characters end up in Sesostris's tarot cards. We've had you know, oh, well, you, you imagine it—it it has happened um, to everybody else. I became else. sunshine. Uh, but the, but the players who succeeded, one one of them ended up in the fifties at the play, you know where everything's Ooh. mixed up. He became sun sunshine, the patient that ends up in the mental hospital. Yeah, that was just um, here, yeah, yeah, those men. yeah, yeah. So none of the players characters who survived, none of the agents would ever want anything to do with King Yell. They they need a bullet before they even. None great. of them were like, yeah, it was great. It would be like, oh yeah, well I gotta go. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, so I can't imagine a second, uh, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think I could do it. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm like, on, I'm, our, oh, oh, sorry. Go guys. No, no, you go. <laughs> oh, I was just saying I'm on to something new right now. I'm writing another big campaign that, that is like the complete opposite of all that stuff. So, uh, nice. which should be fun. Well, I mean, not to give you a little spoiler, I guess this is, but we, struggled with the end and what what made sense for each of us as individual characters and so we instead of having like one set path we incorporated three different endings in the show cool. and it was it was a nice way to like get more like exposure to what the story can do but it also sure. like r really helped us come to terms with the fact that it was ending and this is what our characters are resigned yeah, to. Yeah, we had tissues nearby. So oh, many. Oh, my that's eyes out. oh, yeah. When I found out I was sunshine, cried, cried, oh, cried, oh, cried. I'm like, I've sunshine for the, all of eternity. <laughs> Can't talk or communicate. Yeah, it was awful, but it was good. It was good, but it was awful. It's poetic. Yeah. It yes. was very poetic. And <laughs> Jess and I, our two characters were the only ones that made it from beginning to end. And, and that's not for lack of trying. Yeah. Uh, we got every, really lucky with oh dice man. rolls. Like eight oh, times. Nice. I was, I can't believe how many times I rolled badly, poorly, you know? You got me down to <laughs> like a, five hit points you know, at a, one a sh point. A shotgun blast away. Yeah. A shrapnel piece away, and you yep. would have been gone. I Many other people died, uh, yep. NPCs and whatnot, but. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so much more fun really to well. come out of it, you know, when you're yeah. actually at risk. It, it really makes a huge difference in the game. 
you know? Yeah. yeah. So many roles that I was just like, this is it, guys. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Kevin. I rolled it. really well. Couldn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of want to highlight. Uh, so my sister is incredibly crafty. Uh, I kind of want to highlight some of her work here for some of our handouts uh, really quick. So, um, oh, cool. you know, she she made some paper mache masks for us to wear. Nice. Things like that. Um Jess the Fars Go Aetia is the biggest that's, one. That's, our, that's my favorite thing here. Is this um, one. Oh, can, nice. Do you want me yeah, to see Yeah, it's the artist. Yeah, Fars Go Aetia. Yeah. 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 yeah she recreated it. That's, that's Barbus's. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. That's really cool. It, and it's a full on book. All, yeah. all like the all of it's in, in there. there. there Every tiny nice. bit that you could find in there. The uh, the whole text is in there. There's uh, creepy drawings from the play cool. in there. She made the patsu. The patsu, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. She made oh, the, the yeah, invitation. invite there. Nice. And that's you know, really cool. Some of the, whichever one of these you could rip it open and there was like the hidden ledger in there as oh, well. That's awesome. like, and uh, really she had stuff. like a, a seal that she oh, put nice. like with uh uh, with a with a crown on it, a golden crown seal. So she melted wax and things like that. Oh, cool! Uh, that's uh, that's one of the uh, melonia plant and yeah. uh, one of the golden beetles. Yeah, the she made, she yeah. made, she carved that out of wax for us, and oh, wow. that was one other prop we had. And, it's a bay leaf. <laughs> yeah, it's just a bay leaf, but we we, we called it a, Bolo- a melonia plant. Uh, but yeah, I, awesome. I would just I would just be like, hey, tomorrow I need a <laughs> I need a, a, an invitation. Um, oh, we have Abby's uh, uh, thing written on the a invitation. menu there. Uh, oh Hotel yeah, Badal yeah. In there. Uh, so what she wrote, and then it's actually yeah. a real menu that she created with uh, for for Hotel Berdalbin. She actually researched oh. what foods were popular around that time that Hotel Berdalbin <laughs> would have been a thing. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so it's a menu. That's great. Yep, yeah. it's a it's a menu written on the back of a menu. So yeah, she's really brilliant, and I. I uh, I just wanted to highlight those because those 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 made the campaign better. You know, she, yeah, just, that's she awesome, did an awesome yeah. job. The so, Ars Goetia is my favorite. Like so the intricacies that oh. she put in there and the detail that she put into that book and smudged it so it looked like you know Barbus had like machine oils, yeah, yeah. machine yeah. oils <laughs> and all that stuff. There's like sh- it in awesome. faces in it and everything else. Cool. Like, she had like because she just has crafty shit all over her house. Like she had like. <laughs> card stock that she she's like oh this is kind of art deco and she'd put that in there and <laughs> nice yeah it's insane. really cool so, so dennis you mentioned a new project you're working on can you give us any sneak peek into what you're doing <laughs> yeah. Uh, reason to know. <laughs> yeah yeah so it it's a bit of a it'll be a bit of a spoiler uh but you know if you want to just mark spoiler in front of it and if people want to sure. hear it they can yeah. um so sure uh i i'm for like I, you know, since the early 80s, I've been obsessed with uh, Life After Death and um, uh, Mothman and, Ooh, yes. you know, Richard Keel and all that kind of stuff. So I'm writing a, 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 a in Delta Green Majestic, which is the, the government agency tasked to investigate extraterrestrials. Uh, by the 80s, they're experimenting with things like... Um, trapping one loop line consciousness on an end brain in a proton accelerator, you know, in other words, like kill, kill a, kill an agent and then capture his consciousness in a containment trap. Um, So I'm working on something that has to do with something called hyperdimensional extrusions, which this is all based on real physics right now. They believe the current theory is that consciousness is somehow a loop outside of four dimensional physics that is attached to biology. This is why a, a, a brown bear isn't smarter than a man, even though their brain is much larger. It's just a little hook in space time. Um, <laughs> and uh, so the idea of synambular form possession and such, um, I don't know how familiar you are with like uh, the Goa and other um, people who get possessed in Haiti and things like that. Those are all very physical, real things that are measured by science. People routinely get things like, you know, let's shove a knife through your hand and you can choose to bleed or not when the spirit is possessing you. Um, And these things have all been tested under laboratory conditions and are fully, wholly not understood, but are just ignored. Um, So I'm writing up a a campaign where uh, the agents have to deal with um, hyperdimensional extrusions 
uh, hyperdimensional intelligences that possess people. And the more you pay attention to these things, the more they propagate. Um, it, it, this is demonic haunting. Um, and these spirits and things from other realms, whatever they might be, they could be the spirits of the dead, they could be another intelligence. Um, they can see space-time in a way that we can't. They can see briefly into the future sometimes. They can see accidents coming. They can, they can even cause things. So, you know, it, it's, it's a very twisted campaign that begins with you discovering that a majestic scientist has trapped a um, hyperdimensional extrusion that he can ask yes-no questions to in a little bottle box he's created, and it can see space-time in a way that's unique and it can be tortured in this machine to give up answers. Um, oh, uh, I oh, cannot, shit. I cannot wait to play this. Oh Holy <laughs> shit. So, so that's, that's the beginning. That's the set off event. You end up with this in your possession. And the more you kind of research and pay attention to it, the more these things start to invade your life. Um, because um, your thinking about them is what causes the intersection in space time that allows them to manifest. In other words, you're opening doors every time you even talk about them or, um, oh, consider them in thought um so that's that's kind of what i'm working on now and it, wow. it would be a it, it's a big campaign it's you know four or five link scenarios that all deal with the same concept wow wow yeah. that's crazy we'll be playing that one yeah <laughs> for sure cool. yep yep we'll ride on well, I, I don't want to keep you all afternoon. I, I mean, I could sit here and talk to you for hours, but is there anything you want to promote or anything uh, new that uh, people should be looking for? So our latest, what was our latest? So we just released, um, hang on, let me, let me, let me find the oh, book. Yeah, I don't want to time. say it wrong. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> it just gives uh, us an excuse to look at your office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hang on a second. So do I even have a copy of it? Um, so our latest big book beyond impossible landscapes is iconoclasts by Scott yes. Clancy, which is yes. a huge, um, it's the opposite of impossible landscapes in all possible ways. It's a investigative Tom Clancy, you know, occult conspiracy stuff set in a very real time and place with deep, deep research. And I love that Clancy always brings the deep historical research. So if you want to learn you know, what the hell happened in Mosul in the Iraq war? This is the book to read because it's super detailed. It's, you know, he's talked to people, he's read books, he's, he's crazy. So Iconoclast is, is one. Um, and I, the latest scenario is, I believe it's called From the Dust, which is, um, I wrote that and that is set in Brooklyn, New York. Children are going missing around the old Sudgam mansion, um, which is being converted to condos. Uh, and you find out that there is some sort of weird weirdness. Animals are haunting the place um, that look like raccoons. Uh, and, All right. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. So that one's fun. Um, look like raccoons. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> quote unquote. Writing, look like. I'm almost done with God's teeth, so I'm illustrating yes. that right now. Uh, and then the last bit is I'm writing. Uh, I'm writing a, a long form 1980 scenario set in New York called uh, uh, In the Darkness Spoke, which is about the fate and uh, a serial killer in New York in the mid 80s and the crack epidemic where I kind of grew up. So uh, it's, it's, it's really a place in time thing where I kind of remember being a kid uh, more than anything else. So quite fun. Nice. Wow. So we got lots to look forward to and lots to play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So are you caught up on all of our books? Because we got a bunch no. of scenarios. We got to get caught up. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. working through them. We got plenty. We, we originally had played a few of the scenarios just as for fun. And then that was when we were like, hey, what if we did a podcast? Asked. <laughs> hey, cool. We did That's this. great. Yeah. So, so really, this all started as uh, we were all a, a D and D group running a campaign, and and Kevin, you know, was like, "Hey, why don't I run Last Things Last for you guys?" And nice. it was just it was a date night for me and my wife. Marlene haunts my <laughs> dreams. Yeah, that was our date night. Was Last Things Last, and Kevin ran it. It was just the three of us, and and we were hooked. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So Delta Green's Good, been our yeah. thing. I love I love that scenario. 
Uh, it's That's, perfect. It's 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 yeah it, yeah. It's, it's the perfect beautiful. hook into Delta yeah. Green. It's hooked so many people that I know. They're like, oh, okay. last things last, and now we play it. So and, 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 so yeah. oh yeah. So promotion wise, I will say that uh, last things last is now up on Roll Twenty for four yes. ninety nine, and it has all the rules, all the pre made characters, all the maps, and the entire scenario. It's all pre programmed, and the uh, Delta Green character sheet on Roll Twenty is free. If you create a new game and select it, it's a great sheet. It has, you know, auto upgrades for skills at the end. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, yep, does all the it. dice That's roll. exactly <laughs> what we use. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's great. It's awesome. I highly recommend it, too. Oh, yeah. um, I got to say, like, we've only been doing this for a little over a year, but, like, the reception that we have gotten from from Delta Green and from Arc Dream has been so amazing. The support you guys have given oh. us, like, we, we cannot thank you guys enough. Thanks. Yeah. You can thank, you know, Rachel, uh, and Rachel is Shane's wife. So Shane Ivy is one of the partners in Delta green. Um, and he's my main business partner. You know, he does a lot of the editing, a lot of the writing. Um, but he's also, you know, the let's get the books printed without him. None of this would roll, but Rachel, she goes out of her way to kind of reach out and talk to people and make sure everybody's happy. And she's just great at that. Yeah, we're hoping a, to inter- we're hoping to interview sorry. Shane at the end of Extreme Ophelia too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah, put him on the grill about the, the goddamn <laughs> baby because that creeps me out. <laughs> oh yeah, we just yeah, we just had that happen. We just had yeah. that happen, and it yeah. that was rough. Yeah, yeah we yeah. definitely have to mark this spoiler section yeah. on this. <laughs> yeah. from here on out. Sorry, yeah. um, no, but, you're fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, and as far as like the Delta Green audience goes, you know, we have guys and gals who have been there for 25 years who are still here who, you know, and we, we tend to, we tend to be very inclusive, but very guarded with, you know, we don't allow for any nonsense that usually creeps in a lot of different places. People get ejected immediately. And it's Mm -hmm. a really rare community where you never, you're never going to show up and find like some guy posting swastikas and let's go here. Those guys get like flushed down the toilet instantly. And it's been, it's been that way since 97. You know, we've never suffered through any of like troll fest '98 or anything. Never happened um, <laughs> right, because yeah. I've noticed fan, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, our fans are so kind of uh, self policing, and they know what they want, and they they're awesome. You know, we I've never met a Delta Green fan uh, who gave me any form of static besides like, can I have a free book or something? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what's in my bottle, Dennis. I'm still waiting. That's the same. <laughs> that, let me, was, let me you. that was a two-hour argument between Troy and Kevin. Like, Kevin, what the fuck is in my bottle? Like, <laughs> drunk, two o'clock in the morning. What? What yeah. is in my bottle? We, we usually had an argument after every scenario. <laughs> we yeah. usually we usually had like a, a, a tasteful, you know, back and forth about it, and then uh, we'd have a couple more drinks, and then we'd just be like, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> oh, 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 our postcard. Oh yeah, did you get our postcard? Oh yeah, yeah, thank Yay. you. Yeah. 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 it's yeah. upstairs on the mantle. Nice. Oh, wow. That's awesome. My, my wife was like, "What is this?" And I was like, <laughs> "I was like, oh, it must be someone playing Impossible Landscapes." You know, someone yep. asked me for my address last week, so I, <laughs> and so, you gave it. I, I got the biggest yeah. kick out of that. I'm like, because I asked for your PO box, and I'm like, we we were all at the wine bar having wine, and I'm like, yeah. I'm going to ask Dennis for his address and we're going to send him a <laughs> postcard because this place just sends postcards and they're like, he's not going to give it to you. I'm like, I'm going to ask anyway. Oh, of course. <laughs> why, why wouldn't I? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's always great to get, you know, stuff like that. It, it, it kind of rejuvenates you. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. You know, I the occasionally get a, our... let, a, a letter or a photo and, and it's, you know, you can tell people are having fun out there because of something you did. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, we're yeah. at the wine bar. We call it a business meeting. <laughs> yeah. 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 And for a monthly right business off. meeting. Yeah, we were like, yeah. how do we were like, how do we make this unique? And like, we put like beer rings on it and distressed it. Cool. Like, we told them we're like, don't try to iron this out or anything. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to look like this. this. This is like a classy wine bar, and we can come in and handle <laughs> hand in this thing. Yeah, all covered in covered like, in grub. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's no, supposed it was, to look it, like this. We promise. It was great. Thank you. No, well, thank awesome. you. <laughs> well, Dennis, we want to thank you for taking the time out to to kind of chat and answer some of our questions. Uh, of make sure you you follow Dennis on Twitter. He's very active on Twitter um, and very <laughs> responsive. Believe me, we we tweet <laughs> yes. at him all the oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and thank you to you guys and and Rachel and Shane Ivy. They have been 
fucking phenomenal with us and, and interacting with us and even setting up this interview. Uh, so thank you for taking the time out to to kind of shoot the shit with us for uh, for a little bit. We sur- surely appreciate you. Yeah. No, anytime. Anytime. And thank you for making uh, Impossible Landscapes. It yeah. is iconic oh. now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this point, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, not to get too long-winded, but uh, Larry DeTio, the guy who wrote Mask of Yarrow Thotep, you know, I got to meet him a couple times. Really nice dude. Also wrote Masters of the Universe. Uh, wow. You know, but he wrote nice. he wrote my favorite game book of all time, Master Mural Hotel. And I was yeah. like, I'm thinking of writing, a, uh, you know, a campaign. This was years ago. And he was like, no, no, think about it. Just do it, you know, and make it better than masks. Like, just kill me dead. There so you I, go, guys. I, wow. Just do it. So, yeah. so I tried really hard and I don't think I made it. Um, but I think Larry would would have liked the book, uh, which is a, a, a good thing. But yeah, aiming... You know, you aim for the the moon, you hit the ceiling. But you know, yeah, yeah, you try it. Well, we'll be sure to send you each a copy of the campaigns that we write. Just if nothing else, for you to look sure. at. Sure. And- <laughs> we'll, we'll, we, we check out. We check out any submission. You know. Um, We'll mail it to your uh, house. <laughs> <laughs> cool. With a twenty dollar bill, like, hey Dennis, here you go, buddy. Make it worth your worth your while. Here's twenty yeah. American dollars. Yeah. 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 Also it getting Looney and Toonies. <laughs> yeah, Looney yeah. just uh, and Toonies. I don't mind sending it there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but sincerely, thanks. Uh, you gave us a, a year full of joy and oh, awesome. anger and fear insanity. and yeah. insanity. insanity. So Absolutely. thank you. We, oh, we great. greatly appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching the Doom Vision podcast. uh, And you can see Extremophilia premiering next Friday uh, right here on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you watch your podcast. So thanks so much for watching. Have a good night.